It's a pleasure to be here to talk about SDG number six, which is what related to water, uh, sanitation, and hygiene. I'll just start by saying something that you probably all realize, which is that water is required for life. Uh, it serves many roles in our global community. We rely on it for things like sanitation and uh, moving of waste uh, to treatment plants here in Canada, for example, but also moving human waste to other places in other places of the world. Um, it's also essential for irrigation of crops and thus underpins much of the agriculture industry um, that we rely on to supply our food. Water is also required for good hygiene, which is a critical element of reducing disease transmission and preventing uh, some of the infectious diseases that I'm interested in uh, and research. So I'll touch on those throughout my talk kind of superficially, um, but I'll focus more thinking broadly about SDG number six uh, for the beginning of the talk. Obviously, um, we also rely on water for drinking. Hopefully some of you are drinking some right now. Um, and uh, we usually take our freshwater resources for granted here in Canada, so we often don't worry about what comes out of our tap, although recent news articles maybe gave us a bit of a pause on that. But in other places in the world, uh, having access to clean drinking water is a real problem. And we also rely on water for recreational activities. Uh, if you go to the lakes here in Alberta to recreate, you might be in for a bit of a treat with cyanobacterial blooms or things like swimmer's itch, which I'm also interested in. Um, but in other places in the world as well, uh, water is used for recreation and cooling off in hot climates. Something that ties all of these different functions of water together is that they're predicated on being able to have access to clean and safe water. Um, and uh, that means that we need to have clean uh, source water uh, and uh, access to uh, ambient waters that allow us to have clean drinking water, use sanitation uh, effectively, and have good hygiene. So that brings me to SDG 6. SDG 6 is clean water and sanitation, which is to uh, really ensure access to water and sanitation for all. And SDG 6 has 11 uh, global indicators that are tracked, but for the purposes of this talk, I've really distilled them down into three main themes. The first theme is related to improving access to clean water, sanitation, and hygiene facilities. And this is where I'll spend the bulk of my time in my talk today. The second theme is improving ambient water quality reducing stresses on freshwater resources, and protecting freshwater ecosystems. And the third theme relates to using water more efficiently, supporting local and transboundary water management and infrastructure development. And I'll touch on these last two themes later on at the, in the later half of the talk. It's important to recognize that SDG 6 builds out of the Millennium Development Goals, which hasn't been something we've talked about um, very much in these SDG talks, but I think it's important to recognize that a lot of the SDGs are predicated on successes and maybe some failures that stemmed from the Millennium Development Goals. So SDG 6 stems directly from MDG 7, which was to ensure environmental sustainability. And that also seems like a pretty broad topic, which has been broken down into a few sustainable development goals now. That pr preservation of environmental sustainability um, also involved a preservation of biodiversity um, element, as well as a fairly bold statement at the time, which was to have the proportion of global population that lacked access to clean drinking water and sanitation. If we focus in on that particular part of the MDGs, the MDGs, just to give you a bit of background, they tracked data between 2000 and 2015, and they compared that track data to a baseline data set that was collected in 1990. And MDG 7 aimed to tackle these two really massive aims, which was to half the proportion of the world's population that lacked access to clean drinking water and effective sanitation. There are a few things that I wanted to highlight from the MDGs that really are going to help me springboard into some of the MDG, or SDGs that I'm going to talk about. So the first is that with relation to drinking water and sanitation, we see that urban populations are very much more likely to have access to improved drinking water and sanitation. And so you can see that in this comparison here where I've highlighted the urban and rural comparison with the urban being on the left and the rural being on the right. You can see that the dark blue at the bottom of those little line graphs, which transitions from 1990 to 2015, is higher on the left-hand side, which is the urban graph. So we see about 79% of the world's population having access to improved water on premise, drinking water in urban environments but in rural environments, only 33% of the world's population has access to that same level of drinking water quality. And the same holds true for sanitation, where we see a much higher proportion of the world's population participating in uh, open defecation as an example of sort of our poorest level of sanitation. And that is much higher in rural communities than it is in urban 
I don't want to be too negative in this talk. It's easy to do that when you're talking about um, water and the SDGs. And so um, I wanted to highlight that the drinking water goal from the Millennium Development Goals was actually met. The global access to uh, improved drinking water was increased by 15% um, worldwide, which was a real success story. Um, it left essentially only about 9% of the world's population lacking access to improve drinking water facilities. The story wasn't quite as good for sanitation. We didn't meet the MDGs for sanitation in 2015. While that is true, there was an increase uh, in access to sanitation facilities by about 19% globally, which is great. Still, 23% of the world's population lacked access to improved sanitation access, um, which is a real focus now for the SDG 6. The SDGs really have now been built under uh, that, that sort of story of the MDGs, and one of the things that came out of the MDGs was the WASH in initiative from the, from the UNICEF group. Um, WASH is sort of this big, um, big program that allows us to help measure some of the impacts of improving water, sanitation, and hygiene. And so WASH stands for Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene. From the WASH initiative, now we have a number of metrics that we can set as baselines for the SDGs. We have much better defined metrics for our ability to actually track success in the SDGs. WASH is starting off with some statistics that I just wanted to highlight for you, that about 800 million people in the world remain without basic drinking water services, and about a quarter of healthcare facilities in the world lack basic drinking water access. From the sanitation side of things, approximately 700 million people still practice open defecation globally. While in Canada is maybe one of the exceptions to this statement, over 80% of human wastewater is still discharged into ambient waters without any sort of treatment. And these are important statistics to keep in mind as we move into some of the ways we might try to help facilitate uh, advancing SDG 6, keep them at the front of your head. And then within the topic of hygiene, about 40% of people worldwide don't have access to proper hand washing facilities at home. And one out of every six healthcare facility in the world lacks basic hygiene services. So you can imagine from a healthcare standpoint, this is a big deficiency where we have some healthcare facilities, one out of every four, that don't even have access to clean drinking water, and then one out of six that have no access to proper uh, hygiene facilities as well. These uh, elements that have stemmed from the WASH initiative and the MDGs have really set up um, a way for us to start measuring success in SDG 6. And one of the things that are really predicating all this data collection and, and the main driver of, of a lot of the work related to SDG 6 is uh, an attempt to try to reduce diarrheal disease, which are caused by a lot of the infectious agents that uh, stem from having access to poor drinking water, poor sanitation, or poor hygiene. Diarrheal disease is a real problem globally, and again, this is something probably a lot of people in the audience have had a bout of diarrhea in the last little while. You might have gotten a norovirus here or there, and usually you probably don't go to the doctor when you do, and so um, I'll start by saying that tracking diarrheal disease globally, if it's difficult to do it here because people don't tend to report having diarrheal disease very frequently, um, imagine how difficult it is if you're going somewhere where um, you have less uh, infrastructure than we do here. Nonetheless, diarrheal disease is a very significant cause of mortality and morbidity worldwide. It leads to approximately 1.7 million deaths annually. This is the third leading cause of death for children under five. About 800,000 children every year die from diarrheal disease. And another way of putting that is that uh, for every 10 child deaths um, every year, one of them uh, is caused, one out of 10 is caused by diarrheal disease. So this is a very significant, um, a significant burden that really stems from having poor water quality. The causative agents of diarrheal disease are quite variable, and this is one of the reasons why it's a difficult topic to tackle. We have viral agents like rotavirus and adenovirus, which cause a significant number of deaths worldwide and a much higher number of infections that don't lead to death. We also have bacterial agents like cholera and shigella, campylobacter, non-typhoidal salmonella. These are also other causative agents of diarrheal disease that can lead to various adverse outcomes. And then in that yellow box on the side, you can see those are protozoan parasites, which are kind of getting closer to what I'm interested in researching. Those also lead to a number of different outcomes, including deaths related to diarrheal disease. My main interest from a research perspective are parasitic worms, which aren't on this slide, don't cause as many deaths, but um, infect over a billion people worldwide um, and lead to a number of different long-term complications. From the perspective of controlling these types of agents, um, for some of them, like rotavirus, we've been able to develop vaccines, which have been quite successful in certain areas at reducing the amount of morbidity associated with rotavirus infection. But this vaccine doesn't get distributed um, properly worldwide, and it, we can't vaccinate for all of these different targets. And so um, it becomes quite complicated in terms of trying to tackle diarrheal disease. Um, and really, 
Um, this is a disease, these are diseases that stem um, from agents that associate with poor water quality and also are exacerbated by the lack of, of um, funding and resources in terms of trying to track them and uh, control them. So um, while we know that diarrheal diseases can be caused by a number of different agents, what unifies them all is really that they disproportionately tend to affect children, uh, women, uh, and people living in poverty. And um, the disease that I'm most interested in studying is a disease called schistosomiasis. This is a disease that's transmitted to people in fresh water. And we work on this disease in a variety of different communities. Um, but we notice um, with this disease and also other parasitic diseases in particular that they tend to disproportionately affect women in the community who are often um, uh, tasked with gathering drinking water or water for washing. That interface with the water for them tends to predispose them to being uh, exposed to um, infection. Children um, also are often um, disproportionately affected by diarrheal diseases um, and, and parasites in general. That leads to a situation like you see on the larger uh, photo in this slide where um, this is a school uh, that we work in in Ghana where every child in this image is infected with human schistosomiasis. And so we have very, very high infection prevalences that lead to long-lasting uh, chronic disease. Um, even if the children aren't, aren't dying from these infections, they um, have long-lasting complications. And we can track that in other ways, too, where we can see the association between diarrheal disease and poverty quite clearly. If you just map um, capital uh, GDP um, uh, per country, uh, which is on the x-axis of this graph um, that I'm showing you, with the prevalence or the rate of diarrheal disease, death rate of diarrheal disease on the y-axis. And the point I'm trying to show you here is that if you move further to the left on that graph, you're getting into countries that have very low GDPs, and you can see that they track higher on the rate of death related to diarrheal disease. And this is even worse for countries where we have internally displaced people um, as a high proportion of the population where access to permanent facilities are, are really lacking. So I've told you that there are vaccines in some cases, that um, there are ways that we can try to intervene, but really what's come to the forefront after uh, the WASH initiative and the emergence of the SDGs has been that the WASH um, plan uh, to improve access to clean drinking water, improve sanitation, and improve hygiene is really one of the best ways to intervene when it comes to diarrheal disease. We know that the risk of diarrheal disease decreases by about 17% when you have a population that has access to improved drinking water quality. We know that the risk of diarrheal disease decreases by about 36% when you have access to better sanitation services. And we know that the risk of diarrheal disease decreases by about 47% when you have access to hand washing facilities that include soap. So this brings me to the other themes that I wanted to talk about, which really now when we think about how we can implement these wash initiatives and improve drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene, we need to start thinking about how we can protect our ambient water resources and more effectively and efficiently use our water. I feel like one of the best ways to, to talk about this is to just show you the water cycle, which really just is a sort of a basic way of demonstrating where our drinking water and uh, our fresh water comes from. We have our, our oceans, our saltwater resources. We have a lot of evaporation from those uh, lakes, oceans, and streams that condenses up in clouds. We have also transpiration from plants that contribute to those clouds. And then we have precipitation that comes from those clouds that is collected as surface runoff and then eventually contributes to groundwater. What I want to emphasize is that it's really that surface runoff and surface water that's our most accessible resource when it comes to fresh water for drinking and sanitation. As we saw in the Hemp Act talk, they gave you a number of about 0.5% of our water resources are accessible. I'm going to give you a much more bleak number than that. 0.007% of our total water on Earth is easily accessible for use. So about 2.5% of our global water supply is fresh water. About 1.2% of that fresh water is easily accessible surface water. And out of that surface water, about 22% of it is accessible uh, in the form of lakes and rivers, which is where we typically draw our water resources from. But it's also where we typically discharge our wastewater. So this is something we have to really start thinking about, is how are we impacting our ambient water? And what does that mean for our ability to access clean drinking water? This is all exacerbated by the fact that the demand on global freshwater resources has never been higher. So we're at a point now where we have about 50% of the, of the global population already experiencing water scarcity. Water demand has outpaced population growth. As you can see in that big blue graph on the left, 
And we also know that freshwater withdrawal as a share of the internal resources for a, a country, which is really just how much water does the country have and how much is it taking away, that is also quite uh, high in many countries where you can see the, the countries that are red on those maps are places where they are very high risk because they are taking more water than they have access to and they're taking more than they can replace. How do we achieve SDG 6 in the context of this sort of sad story I've told you? Um, I want to leave you on a bit of a high note rather than a low note. So um, I wanted to leave you with a few um, comments on how we can best achieve SDG 6, in, at least in my opinion. The first is to innovate. This is an area where I think people at the University of Alberta are doing some really exciting work. These are um, initiatives that have been started in various countries around the world to try to think differently about how we use water and how we think about building cities around water. So this is just an example from Hamburg, Germany, which is now being mirrored in Alberta in a housing development that's being uh, coordinated in St. Albert, where we have wastewater recapture and wastewater reuse, gray water reuse, and methane capture from the waste as a way to heat power homes and provide gray water for various purposes um, that are fit for use in the home. And so this uh, way of decentralizing water, not thinking about it going to a central treatment plant, um, is a unique way of thinking about how we can build communities more sustainably. And it is also a very useful tool for trying to think about how we might be able to approach giving water to more rural communities without having to rely on some of the more traditional ways we think about treatment. We can also think differently. So this means thinking about the waste products that we have, things like um, our poop, as a commodity, an economic commodity, rather than as a waste product. There's entire agencies that are devoted to thinking about ways that we can economize um, waste. One of them is a company called Lou Watt, which has this little toilet that I'm showing you here, where you poop into this little bag, it seals it up nice and tight, and then you can bring that in or use it yourself to do methane recapture, power a little USB charger to charge your phone while you're taking a poop, or actually go to a more central facility to provide power. And this is just one example that are, there's a number on this uh, circular slide. The point is that there's a lot of in, uh, investment going into thinking about waste differently. We need to think about the other SDGs. In this slide, I've highlighted that water connects them all, which I think is true. While I don't want to say that it's more important than the other SDGs, I think that we need to think about how the water SDG is an important element of all SDGs and that it can tie into all of them very directly. I want to leave you with a final thought. Um, which is that it's easy to think about the SDG 6 in the context of developing countries. I think it's important to recognize that this is not just an issue that's far away from home. So this is a slide from Indigenous Services Canada that shows the number of drinking water advisories on in Indigenous reservations in Canada. And you can see that where that red bubble is, is 2020, where we have 58 long-term drinking water advisories in Canada on Indigenous reservations. You can see that there's a trajectory that slopes downward to zero by 2021, which is great. But I think this is still to emphasize that Canada still has work to do as well in this area and that we're not batting 100%. So I just want to leave you with some successes of the SDGs so far because SDG 6 is ambitious, but they, there's a lot of work being done to try to achieve it. So we have an 8% increase in global access to safe drinking water since 2005, a 13% increase in global access to safe sanitation. Numerous countries have begun to monitor ambient water quality and track wastewater discharge, which is a big step in being able to actually show we're doing something. Water scarcity has been identified as a global issue and the pace of freshwater ecosystem loss has actually declined. We've even gained freshwater ecosystems in some places such as North America, Europe, and Australia, and in parts of South America, Africa, and Asia. And so these are encouraging um, early reports back from the SDG 6, where we still have 10 years to go, so hopefully we keep this trajectory moving. So thanks very much, everyone.